Welcome back to the GCN Tech Clinic where I try and solve your bike related problems. So if you've got one, leave it for me down there in the comments section below or alternatively on all forms of social media using the hashtag AskGCNTech. So with no further ado, let's crack on with the first question this week and it comes in from GMAC who says, Hi, my wife recently purchased a Bianchi XR3 and our darling son got a little carried away when swinging his Power Ranger toy around and knocked the bike over and chipped the paint on the top tube. Can we get away with just repainting the top tube instead of the whole frame? Thanks, Glenn. Uh, amazing question, this one, Glenn. Um, and well, swinging around that Power Ranger toy. Cheeky little summon. So, right, there is two things here which you're gonna do. The good news is you don't need to repaint that whole frame. The bad news is, no matter how good you are at touching up paint with some of these little chip sticks and things like that which you can get, you aren't gonna get a factory-like finish on there. So it all depends really on your level of OCD or your wife's level of OCD on that new Bianchi of hers. Um, personally, I probably wouldn't even try it. I would try and cover up the chip though with some lacquer or some clear nail varnish, something like that, to try and stop any water from getting in there or the chip actually spreading any further. And maybe look for a little cool decal or decal or sticker to actually cover it up. Um, because if you are gonna respray the whole frame, it is gonna cost you a pretty penny. But like I said, it all does depend on your own levels of OCD there. Just uh, keep those Power Ranger toys out of arm's length in the future, I reckon. Next up is John Potter. Now, John Potter says, when replacing a worn or damaged cleat, should you, as a matter of course, replace the bolts and spacers at the same time? Thanks for the informative videos, John. John Potter, nice to hear from you. Right, it all depends really on the current state of the heads of the bolts which are attaching your cleats onto the shoe. If they're starting to get rounded off at all or they look like they've been touching on the ground because your cleats have been that worn away or the spacers are cracked, it can happen, uh, then yeah, put the new ones on. Generally, I tend to put fresh new bolts on there because believe it or not, those old bolts, they can start to get a little bit corroded and the strength and integrity of them can also be compromised. Because if you don't do that as well, you end up just putting those new bolts into a jam jar full of brand new bolts that you never get round to using. So yeah, I'd put the new ones on. Next up is David Ide, who says, John, your tech shows are great, I watch every one. Thank you, David, I'll answer your question now. Uh, my question is, I have some very high-end wheels with very light titanium skewers. The skewers have to be very tight, possibly even over tight, to stop a clicking sound when climbing hard. I've lubed the skewer, shaft and nuts, but they still need to be extremely tight to prevent this clicking. It seems like they stretch. Is this okay, or should I buy some high quality but heavier skewers? Right, David, you aren't gonna like this mate, because I would say go for the heavier steel skewers or just heavier skewers. The reason being, like you say, titanium does tend to stretch. In fact, when titanium bolts are used in automotive or aeronautical industry, once they're fitted <clears throat> and then removed, you can't generally reuse them because they've stretched and they're not gonna give the same style of fitting. I know on a bike we're not putting it through quite the same sort of stresses, but yeah, they do stretch and tend to click. Titanium bikes, Back in the early days, they always seem to make annoying little clicking noises. You've already lubricated the shaft of the skewer and the nut, and that I would have thought would possibly get rid of it if there was any issues there. You could possibly try uh, the axle to drop out interface too to try and stop that from clicking away, because that can be a little problem there. But personally, I'd go back to the heavier steel uh, style skewers because you don't have to tighten them up quite as much and go through that fear, because sometimes if you've spent, I don't know, up to 100 pounds on a pair of skewers and you're clamping them up really tight, you feel like you are gonna strip the thread. So, sorry mate, you're gonna to have to go for the heavier ones, in my honest opinion. Next up is Rodrigo Landeros, who says, John, I have a Shimano Tegra Di2 R8070 group set and I can't connect it to my Wahoo Element Bolt or the eTube app. The junction box jumps to adjustment mode directly without the one second hold for the connection mode. Help. Blimey, this sounds like the uh, Microsoft or Apple help desk more than a tech clinic, but I jest. Okay, first of all, presumably you've got the uh, D-Fly uh, Bluetooth module that goes in between the cables to send the signals and everything. I would check that the firmware on both bits of kit. So go into the YouTube app, plug it all in manually and make sure that you've got the latest bits of firmware across everything on the bike. And then do the same thing with your head unit too, with that Wahoo Element Bolt, and make sure you've got the latest firmware on that too. Because if they're not, then there's likely to be some sort of like cross-talking going on and that's what's causing the problem. Let me know how you get on with that and hopefully it's been solved. Next up is Ben Norley. Now Ben says they've got themselves a 2016 giant TCR Advance and it's got the internal wedge clamp for the seat post. But despite using the correct torque settings, it's stuck. 
Ben can't get the seat post out, it's at the correct height, so not too much of a problem, but Ben wants to go on holiday and it won't fit in the bag with the seat post in place. Any help would be great. Ben, I feel your pain there, mate. You wanna go riding on holiday and you wanna use your own bike and there's nothing better than that, let's face it. What I would suggest is use something like WD-40 or a, a rust penetrator, something like that. Spray it into that uh, wedge internal seat clamp mechanism and allow it to soak in. Hopefully that will break that sort of corrosive bond that's happened. It's normally when an electrolyte becomes present in between the two materials and it kind of fuses them together temporarily and sometimes permanently. Allow that to soak in. Hopefully that will free it up. If not, after a couple of days, yeah, you sometimes have to allow it to soak in for a couple of days. Get the Allen key in there and just gently give it a few taps with a toffee hammer. When I say toffee hammer, it's kind of like one of those very small hammers and you can't put too much force or pressure through it, but it can sometimes just break up that bond. Let me know how you get on with that one. And sorry if any of that anti-C or anti-rust stuff goes down into your seat post and destroys your bottom bracket, but hey, you've got your seat post out. But just uh, take out the cranks maybe and just mop up any residue. Now we've got Milton Smith. Now Milton has got a pair of Shimano 9000 Durace wheels that have about 3,500 miles on them. The question though is at what point should I be concerned about servicing the hubs? Is it based on mileage, and if so, how many, or on performance or noise? Right, Milton, I would personally say when they're not silky smooth or there's a little bit of roughness in them, because generally those Shimano Durace hubs are absolutely brilliant. And well, I can't give you any mileage or intervals because bike parts don't really have any service intervals, so to speak. Uh, but yeah, certainly service them once you start to feel any play or they're rough or they're just not that almost factory-like finish or factory-like state of, of uh, repair or condition. The reason being, if you start to ride them when they're not in good condition, so when the bearings have well, a little bit of play in there, what happens is that the tiny little ball bearings in them, because remember these are cup and cone bearings as opposed to a cartridge system, those ball bearings, they bash against the cones and the races inside and ultimately it could render the hubs or the cones are useless. Some wheels do have replaceable races inside of them. Those are quite few and far between. I'm pretty sure the Shimano Jorace ones don't have that setup. So to keep the longevity of those wheels, basically start servicing them before it's too late. Now we've got Dan Di Vincenzo who says, John, love the show. I have an older SRAM Red 10 speed group set, low miles on it. Occasionally, when I'm trying to shift my front derailleur from the large to small ring, it just won't move. After multiple tries, it eventually moves down and then the rest of the ride is fine. I keep the bike spotless and lube all pivot points. Any ideas? Right, Dan, this could be something to do with the H screw on your front derailleur. Now, I reckon when you're shifting onto the big ring, it's possibly quite difficult sometimes to get it to go on there and stay in position. You're putting that cable under quite a bit of strain. So when it's up there then onto the big ring, the lever mechanism, the ratchets in there are really, really tight and there's almost no room for them to be able to just push that fraction away from one another and then release the cable and go out down onto the small ring. It's kind of like the lever inside is freaking out in its own little way and it's just under so much tension. So to try and solve this, the first thing I would try, because this can happen on plenty of different setups out there, is to just get that H screw on the front derailleur and adjust it counterclockwise, probably about an eighth of a turn, and then try that again. Hopefully it's just gonna free up that tension on the cable and give you probably a better shift onto the big ring, and definitely, I feel, at least I hope it will too, when you go from the big ring onto the small ring. Let me know how you get on with that solution. Now we've got Jabin Lim who says, I currently have a giant propel and the problem is my down tube bottle cage screw cannot be unscrewed as the rivet is loose. Ooh, this one is actually quite common on a few bikes out there. First thing to try and do is to hold the rivet which is inside of the frame, so it's a blind rivet these are called. Try and hold that on either side with a pair of pliers, so a pair of needle nose pliers, something like that where you can get a good grip on either side. And then with an Allen key, try and undo that bolt whilst having a really good firm grip on the uh, blind rivet. You should be able to try and undo that, should be able to start trying to undo that. Of course, if you did use some anti-seize in the first place, because, well, those uh, blind rivets are generally alloy and bolts and generally steel, so those two things don't like one another, really, if they get in there for a long period of time, and, well, you get salt and sweat on them, they start to corrode and join together. So, all of that aside, hopefully you've been able to release it, then take it along to your local bike shop who will have a blind rivet tool, so it threads inside of it and it pops in and it expands that back into place. Generally, they'll probably even put in a new rivet in there too, an M5 uh, setup. Now, 
If you haven't been able to do that, go along to your local bike shop or frame builder and they can solve this problem for you. The best bit of advice I can give you here is to not continue riding that bike with a loose rivet because the reason being, what happens is the bottle will start to rattle and the bottle cage will too and that rivet will start to rattle away. And I've even seen this being done before in an alloy frame and a carbon frame, that hole where it goes becomes overlies, becomes oversized and eventually you can't put a bottle cage bolt back in there or rivet back in there because it's just too big. So you have to start uh, patching it up with carbon or uh, you know, like a, a real bodge of a repair. So that's the best bit of advice I can give you if it's already uh, oversized and you just don't wanna risk ruining it any further. Penultimate question this week comes in from Emil Fitzner, who says, hi John, no matter how much degreaser and soap I use, and no matter how much elbow grease and gizmos, I still can't get my chain perfectly clean. It seems like the grime appears out of thin air. Is there a way to get a perfectly clean chain without using fancy equipment such as an ultrasonic cleaner? Right Emil, make sure that all of the other drivetrain components are clean. So if you're just gonna clean that chain, it's no good I'm afraid my friend, because you're gonna be picking up grime from the chain rings, the jockey wheels, the cassette, those things. And sometimes if you've got a really messy derailleur cage, you can even pick up bits of grime from that too. So the best thing I could say here is take off the wheel uh, so you're not gonna pick up anything from the cassette, clean that cassette, maybe get yourself a little chain catcher which goes in the rear dropout so you can start focusing on the chain and at the same time get those jockey wheels clean too as well as the chain ring. So grab yourself a, an old toothbrush, you don't wanna use a new one do you? And actually scrub away at those components really, really well. Get some pipe cleaners to get in between all of the sprockets on the cassette. And importantly too here is to use a really good degreaser. Now one of the best degreasers out there, and I hate to use it, I hate to recommend it, but I'm just gonna say one of the best ones out there is petrol and also diesel. Very, very dangerous to use, but people out there who obsess over having a clean chain, they generally tend to use that, but loads of off-the-shelf products work absolutely fine too. The final question this week comes in from Sebastian Van Berg. When should you replace the brake and gear cables? Is there a rule of thumb for how many kilometers you should expect to get out of them? And when they're replaced, should you always replace both outer and inner cables, or is it okay to just replace the inners in certain situations? Right, it all does depend on you and your riding conditions, how often you change gear, how often you brake, all of those things. Unfortunately, there's no set uh, recommendations out there. Some people say every couple of years or something, but some people get away with using the same ones for years and years. Ultimately though, and the decision you need to take is when you're gearing or, or brake shifts, those are not quite perfect because everyone wants to have perfect brakes and gears don't they, when you're riding. It adds the enjoyment of, of riding along on your bike. And also in terms of your brakes, it is in fact a safety matter. So if your inner uh, brake cables start to come frayed down where they get clamped, then yeah, replace them as soon as possible. Same thing really for your gears. You don't get, want to get stuck in a, an awkward gear out there. You also mentioned about should you replace the inners and outers together? Yeah, for optimal shifting, optimal braking, most definitely, because there's nothing better, like I've already said, than having good performing parts on a bike. When is it not okay to do it? I guess if you've been in a bit of a rush or you can't be bothered to untape your handlebar tape and put the outers back in there, or if it's an emergency, you know, if you're on, on a trip somewhere and you happen to have a spare inner cable with you, yeah, you can put that in there. But if you wanna get the best performance, then yeah, replace them together. If you haven't got any um, outer cable, or you've got the inner cable, then yeah, you can reuse them. What I would suggest doing is to flush out any grease or grime or bits of muck basically inside of those outer cables with something like WD-40. Flush that out and allow it to find its way out from the bottom. And then just put a few drops of chain lubricant, something like that, in the top. Just allow that then to seep its way down in that cable, just so when you put the inner cable in, it has a, a nice bit of smooth movement in there. Of course, sometimes brake cables have PTFE liners, that sort of thing. Loads of people say don't bother doing that, but I tend to do it anyway if I'm reusing a cable just to give it a little bit of extra life. Right, I hope that's been able to help answer your question, Sebastian. It's not the easiest one out there because different cables work in different ways and while different climatic conditions affect them. I do hope I've been able to help answer and solve your bike-related problem this week on the Tech Clinic. Let me know your questions though down there in the comment section below and I'll do my very best to help answer it. Remember to like and share this video with your friends. Give it a big old thumbs up and remember to subscribe to this channel. Click that like button and also the notification bell so you get notifications each and every time we put a video live. Don't forget, check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com and for two more great videos, how about clicking just down here and just down here.